Hello, everyone. My name is Che Stedman. I'm the Assistant Chief of Medical Affairs for the City of Madison Fire Department in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about our crisis response team, otherwise known as our CARES team. It's a Community Alternative Response Emergency Services, and our program started uh, September 1st of 2021. Um, what I'd like to go through with you is, um, you know, our kind of initial planning phases, um, all of the work with all of the agencies that had to come together to produce the contracts and the HIPAA business agreements and everything else that we needed to do to get a team on the streets. And then I'll get into um, operations and data collection, uh, program evaluation, uh, lessons learned, and some successes that we found. And then um, I'll get into what our future expansion plans are and um, talk to you about how we've used data um, to really kind of plan our progress. So um, just a little background, um, and this is probably similar to most cities around the country, um, the city of Madison's mental health crisis response model has been very law enforcement driven. Um, we, we looked back at a few years worth of data for the Madison Police Department, and we found in 2019 that the police department here estimated it received around 7,000 calls related to mental health crisis. Um, and so when we were researching best practices around the country, we found that um, the model that would fit best in Madison and one that was most patient-centered was a model that incorporated unarmed first responders with mental health providers. And so we were tasked by the mayor's office and the city council to develop a mobile crisis response team to respond to those nonviolent behavioral health-related crisis. And what we really wanted to focus on was ensuring that we had medical and behavioral health care integrated from the onset of a 911 response. So for us, it was all about getting the right resource to the right person at the right time, um, you know, certainly helping to deliver better services to our citizens um, with you know, trauma informed care. But but really, we also wanted to divert people from emergency rooms in jails where they likely weren't going to receive the, the help that they specifically needed. And so when we um, started uh, planning, and this is about July of 2020, um, we had one of our alder persons, Arvina Martin, approach the fire chief at the time and, and talk to us about um, a crisis response team that was similar to a lot of programs she had seen around the country, um, notably, of course, CAHOOTS, uh, the STAR program in Denver, and the San Francisco crisis response team were some of the programs we looked at initially. And we put together a white paper, basically a proposal of what we would need to do um, as a fire department, working with our county health and human services division to um, provide these services. And, and we were fortunate that in November of that year, um, our city council approved funding for an initial pilot program or phase one of our crisis response team. And um, during this time, from November until September 1st, when we started, um, there, there were a lot of really important players that had to come to the table to make this all work. And so just a, a quick list of, of some of the really important agencies and the cooperation that we had to have. Um, it started out with, with Dane County Human Services. So the city of Madison um, is the largest city in our county in Dane County. Um, but this will get a little bit into the statutory stuff specific to Wisconsin. So um, we, we knew that we couldn't just hire a couple of social workers on the fire department and have them go out on calls. And the reason for that is because in state statute, there's a, a Department of Human Services Administrative Code, it's DHS 34 in Wisconsin, that outlines what mobile crisis response teams um, need to do in the state of Wisconsin. And, and that statutory authority is given to every county in the state. So Dane County Human Services was our first phone call, essentially. And luckily, they were very agreeable um, to the program. It fit in with their overall um, behavioral health program. And um, the, the county contracts services with a provider in Madison called Journey Mental Health. Uh, Journey Mental Health has worked with the county for years. They have embedded crisis workers with the police department and the sheriff's department. They handle our Chapter 51 um, issues. And um, so that Journey Mental Health agency was um, contracted with the county to provide mental health services. So that's who our partner ended up being 
in our crisis response team. Um, and, and so Journey Mental Health, Dane County Human Services, the Madison Police Department, and the Dane County 911 Center were really the kind of the core group initially that we that we worked with to make this all happen. Um, I'm sure as you can all imagine, um, this being a 911 service, our 911 Center had to do quite a bit of training in order to be able to triage out this new service that was available to them. Um, and they were very agreeable and worked with us very closely as well. Um, our police department partners um, were in every meeting that we had leading up to uh, the implementation of our team, um, and they were incred incredibly important as well. So during that time, there was obviously contracts that had to be written. Um, we had to get uh, HIPAA business agreements taken care of. Um, the city had to find a way to fund Journey Crisis, which essentially we ended up funneling the salaries and benefits of our Journey Crisis workers through the county so that they could pay them to work with us. So it all got very complicated, and that's why it took us you know, a good 10 months before we were able to actually put a team on the street. And that was with us being very active around getting this program up and running, um, and it still takes a while. So anybody out there that's looking to be, get one of these programs started, um, expect that there's a, a, lo a lot of lawyers that need to talk to each other and a lot of agencies that have to come together with a common vision. So um, once we started hiring our community paramedics for the fire department and the new journey crisis workers to work on our crisis response team, um, we there was certainly some training that, that needed to happen for our paramedics specifically to crisis response. And, and I just want to spend a second talking about that. Um, the, the Madison Fire Department has approximately 400 members. We have 14 fire stations, nine ALS ambulances that have paramedics working on them. And since 2015, we've had a community paramedic program. Um, a traditional community paramedic program really focuses a lot more on healthcare issues. Um, our program specifically looks to visit uh, folks in the community that um, have low acuity, chronic health problems that use the 911 service more than they should. And so that team has been really effective in going out and providing healthcare system education, medication reconciliation, working with them on, um, you know, referring them to the appropriate resource. So it was it was a lot of um, what we consider to be social work heavy type of um, community paramedicine. And so when we were looking at getting into the crisis response world, we had to figure out a way to take those community paramedics and get them ready to, to be able to respond to mental health crisis. And so what we did was we had them go to a 40-hour crisis intervention training through NAMI. Um, uh, there was a UW Green Bay crisis intervention course that we put them through as well, a 17-hour course. And then it was a lot of little trainings, things like sitting in the journey crisis unit, listening to calls, sitting in the 911 center, listening to mental health specific calls. Um, so the, the, the idea that you're just going to take an EMT or a paramedic and throw them into the streets to deal with specifically behavioral health emergencies. Um, it is something that they are trained a little bit in. Typically um, in Wisconsin, we have a 1200 hour paramedic program and about only about 16 hours of those 1200 hours are really focused around mental health. So it, it gives you a sense that, that mental health hasn't been um, possibly a big enough focus um, in our, our previous operations, if you will. So um, other than getting the, the paramedics trained up in order to work on a crisis response team, we also needed to take those crisis workers that were very good at managing crisis and give them training on how to respond to 911 calls. Um, so that's, you know, radio training, scene safety training, um, de-escalation in the community um, and things of that nature. And we, we um, did our best to piece together trainings from as many appropriate agencies, um, excuse me, as many appropriate agencies as we could. We used the Madison Police Department to help, uh, Dane County Human Services, and um, it was it was really a few months of collaborating with a lot of folks to figure out what appropriate training really was. So once the training was taken care of on September 1st of 2021, we put our first team in service, and, and we started small. Um, and, and what we did in order to figure out what times of the day and days of the week that we should really be in service because we we didn't start out as a 24 7 team um, with the budget that we had and the resources available during the day 
And looking at the data, we recognize that we really needed to start out um, Monday through Friday from about 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. And the way we came up with that time frame was looking at two years worth of Madison Police Department data. What they found was it was really truly during the week, during that kind of middle part of the day that they saw the most calls for behavioral health crisis. And the other in our downtown area um, has um, a, a large isthmus where there's a large population of people, plus the UW-Madison, um, the university um, is very close to the downtown area. So that was the geographic area, basically the police central district where we had the highest amount of behavioral health calls per square mile. So our initial kind of phase one implementation was Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. And it was in that central district. And we have a firehouse that is very close to that central district, basically on the east side of it that we house this team out of. And we did that for three months as we were collecting data and evaluating how the program was going. We were working with community partners that we were referring services for our patients to um, and getting really an idea of whether or not what we were doing was best for our community. And um, after about three months of providing the service, we recognized that we had the capacity to, to start responding citywide. And so Madison has approximately 240,000 people, um, and there are a number of small pockets of little communities around us as well. And so um, once we were done with our first three months and started responding citywide, we, we, we had a vehicle issue. So if you see here in this picture, we started responding in a minivan and you can see two of our community paramedics and two of our crisis workers here. And the, the minivan and the civilian type clothing was how we decided that we were gonna start responding because it was a, it was a softer response than having people show up in uniform and emergency vehicles. We wanted to do our best to not escalate people that were already in a behavioral health crisis. Uh, and so this worked well for us for the first three months, but once we started responding citywide, we had to put our responders in an emergency vehicle. And that emergency vehicle ended up being a fire department SUV with lights and sirens that they could use when they needed to. Um, we're, we're very um, thoughtful about the use of, of lights and sirens. And um, we obviously don't want to approach the scene to a behavioral health crisis with our sirens blaring and our lights on. But there were times where they needed to get across the city in a more expedient fashion. So the, the fire department SUV is what we ended up transitioning to. So in December of 2021, we started responding citywide. And then in July of 2022 is when we were able to get a second team on the streets. Um, that first team was kind of on the near east side of Madison. We put the second team on the near west side of Madison to have better coverage of the city. And um we're responding now Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. with um, the two teams. So um, I, I just want to take a step back quick and, and talk a little bit more about um, the data collection and program evaluation. Um, we understood very early on that the fire department um, or Journey Mental Health weren't going to be um, capable of gathering enough data and evaluating it because we didn't have people that had that expertise in our organization. So we partnered with Dane County Madison Public Health and we got a position budgeted um, in that organization for a data um, analysis and, and program evaluation uh, position that really helped us because we, we, we certainly couldn't have done it on our own. And so um, as you're thinking about these teams, you, you really need to also think about the structure around the team. And it's not just, you know, people that are collecting the data and evaluating things, but it's it's clinical supervision as well. So, you know, we, we pay for the salaries and benefits of the journey crisis workers, but we also needed to pay for a portion of the supervision that is provided to those crisis workers as well. And then, of course, the supervision of the community paramedics in this area, um, you know, the the the, the normal job of, of, of a fire chief or a fire supervisor isn't typically to be supervising uh, crisis workers. And so Journey supervises the crisis workers 
We supervise our paramedics and we meet regularly to make sure that both agencies are working um, together well. Obviously, it's 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 incredibly important to have the right people doing these jobs because the work is hard and their ability to get along and work off of each other during these really important 911 calls is incredibly important. So the supervision, the clinical oversight, the data collection and program evaluation are all things that really need to be wrapped around um, these teams that are out in the field to make sure that they're supported and to make sure that what they're doing is truly best practice. Um, the, the other big piece that um, that we learned quickly that we needed to do was was understand the resources in the community. And that might sound obvious, right? There, there's a reasonable expectation that if you're going to be referring clients to services in the community, that you know what those services are, you know when they're available, and you understand the process of how people need to be um given access to the services. So ideally, it's, it's us driving someone to a service, doing a warm handoff with a provider, getting them enrolled in whatever the service is that they need, and making sure that we really take the person from their crisis through the de-escalation, through the on-scene intervention, pardon me, the on-scene intervention, and then that referral process, and making sure that the referral process is handled appropriately. So we had to do a lot of outreach in the community and make sure that that we really had a, a thorough understanding of resources other than the, the emergency rooms, because that's typically where a lot of these patients ended up previously. So um, when we when we talk about the 911 center, um, th there there is a lot of need in, in our opinion to to have specially trained folks in a in a PSAP or in a 911 center. And I, and I would say that it's probably best practice to have a mental health clinician in your 911 center as well that can help triage these calls. Our 911 center is fantastic. They handle the whole county. They've been um, triaging resources for decades, obviously, whether it's police, fire, or EMS. But they did need some extra training around triaging out calls to a crisis response team. And essentially what that came down to was, was following a protocol that they um you know, had talked to other 911 centers around the country that were running programs like this. And um, once they had that protocol developed and they asked the safety questions, then they could just um, dispatch out the CARES team directly. So if it was any sort of behavioral health related crisis and the person didn't have a weapon or wasn't acting in a violent way, they can send CARES directly to the scene. If not, police would still have to respond first. And then that law enforcement officer, when they felt necessary, they can call CARES in and then CARES can take that call over and let that law enforcement officer go do their job protecting the city. So again, the 911 center is, is integral in making sure that this process works well. Um, we, we do have criteria around what, what CARES shouldn't be the first responder on. Um, and again, it's weapons, um, sounds of active disturbance, if a crime is being reported, um, when people are specifically asking for police resources um, around, you know, um, pinging phones and doing other things that only law enforcement officers should really be doing. And then, of course, if an ambulance is needed for medical transport, then we use our fire department ambulances. Um, but other than that, CARES really does go on a wide range of call types. And um, so just to kind of give you an overview again of, of our operations. So it's one journey crisis worker and one fire department community paramedic that is on the team. And they all carry radios. And um, again, we're, we're still operating from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. And each of the teams works a 10-hour shift. So one team starts at 8 a.m., they work till 5 p.m., and then the other team works from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. And we actually give them that last hour of the day to do charting and, and get everything reset as far as their medic bag and, and everything else. So these are actually 10 hour shifts, even though they, they look like nine hour shifts here. Um, and right now we're responding anywhere in the city of Madison. Now the, the disposition of the patient doesn't have to be in the city. In other words, if somebody needs to be taken somewhere out of the city, because that's where their support network is, we will allow our responders to take a, a, a patient 
anywhere else, basically in people down to Chicago to to drop them off. But we we do have the autonomy to to have any destination in the county that is going to be appropriate for the person. And this is a big change for the fire department. You know, historically, we are only allowed to transport people to emergency rooms, and that's by state statute. A 911 ambulance can only go to emergency rooms. And so now that we have the ability to take people to any community resource or to a home or to a homeless shelter or whatever it is, we're, we're just able to offer our, our patients a, a lot more opportunity to receive the help that they need. And, and we don't, the fire department does not charge for these services either. So we're not charging for our transports. And again, we use our lights and sirens very minimally so that we don't upset our client. We typically only use those lights and sirens to respond to the client. And so to get into those dispositions, like I said, the, the team has autonomy. It, it's really the clinical expertise of that crisis worker that decides where a, per, where a person can be best helped. Um, a lot of times they only provide help on site. Um, and there are some times when they only are making contact via phone. And that's sometimes the way that the patient wants it. They'll call 911 and they say they might say, I just want to talk to somebody. I need to I need to find a resource for somebody, whatever it is. So our cares team oftentimes acts like um, a crisis line, if you will. And about 14 percent of our calls are handled over the phone. And that was a bit of a surprise to me. I didn't realize that that so many of, of those calls would be handled through phone contact only. But a lot of a lot of our clients don't want anybody to come visit them. They specifically don't want a police officer. And sometimes they don't even want anybody else. They just want to talk and we can we can manage that as well. Um, so um, but ideally, we're able to take people to the services they need and get them connected. And um, the journey journey mental health does have a crisis unit that is available 24 hours a day for phone calls as well. And, and if anybody um, needs to be placed under an emergency detention to protect themselves from themselves, essentially, um, Journey is also able to help manage those. But then we also, in, in the state of Wisconsin, there has to be a law enforcement officer involved to provide an emergency detention. And, and so when we look at just some general ways that that CARES is improving, improving services out there, um, in, in our first year, we went on approximately 935 calls. And as of today, we've responded to over 2,600 calls. So um, the, the data that I'm showing here is kind of our first year because we did a first year annual report. But we've gotten continually busier every time we've expanded the number of hours or expanded the, ge the geographic um, area that we're responding to or any time that we've, you know, obviously added, added another team, we've just continued to get busier. The, the thing that um, we found to be a way that, that we can consider ourselves successful, one of the metrics is the fact that only 3% of the patients that CARES has responded to have required police transport. So, and that's still true after 2,600 calls, only approximately 3% of the time has law enforcement needed to come in to help manage the situation, whether it was to per, put a person into emergency detention or because the person violated a law and they needed to be arrested. But the, the, the 2,600 calls that we've gone on, in our opinion, is 2,600 times that police did not have to initially respond and manage a call and then we've only had to call them in a handful of times after the fact. And, and it's the same with our medical transports as well. It's only about 4% of the time that we've actually had to call in a, a, a paramedic ambulance to transport a patient for medical needs. So the, the CARES team really is able to handle most of what they're dispatched to um, with just their team. And, um, you know, the the... The feedback that we've gotten from the police department, from the fire department workers that are our normal non 911 responders, the feedback that we've gotten from the um, homeless shelters and the other agencies that provide services for behavioral health crisis, the feedback ha has been very positive. Um, we haven't had a single person say, hey, this program is crap. 
pardon my language, but the, the, the feedback has all been great. And, um, and it speaks to the fact that, um, we, you know, we really tried to be thoughtful about this program. And we, and mo most importantly, we tried to hire the right people. And, and so this just gives you an idea of how our services have kind of expanded over time. Um, this is just kind of call volume. Um, and you can see that, you know, once we expanded the service area and put a second team in service and expanded the hours, we've just continued to increase our call volume. At, at, uh, to date, the, the average calls per week is, is approximately 50. So um, the, that's between the two teams responding 10 hours, you know, approximately nine hours a day, each team, we're, we're averaging about 50 calls a week. And the the other key metric that we're looking at is how many calls we're missing. And so when when we have our CARES teams in service, there are quite a few times where both teams are busy and then police still need to respond to that next call that comes in. And so we've um, un we understand that we're only responding to about 57 percent of the estimated number of mental health related calls that we um, that that are actually generated at the 911 center. And so this gives us the understanding that if we put a third team in service, we're going to we're going to be doing it during the day, during the week, during that kind of peak period so that we can um, hopefully get um, a higher percentage of the behavioral health calls that are occurring in the city of Madison. And, and so to, to look into future expansion, what we hope to do is, um, is and, and we're already hiring the workers right now, we hope in July that we're going to be able to add weekend hours. Um, you know, behavioral health emergencies certainly happen on the weekends, too. Um, even though the data showed it was a little bit less than during the week, we, we really do want to have a seven day a week program. So next month, we should be able to start that. And then in October of this year, we're budgeted to add that one more team during the week, during those peak hours of probably 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. so that we can capture more calls. Um, the the um, I just want to get back to how important it is to have someone or a group of people that's evaluating data and and really um you know data is a kind of that's a very broad term but what we're specifically looking at is all of the patient demographics um so not just gender and not just ethnicity but you know insurance status homeless status veteran status um, we're, we're really interested in whether or not they've connected with mental health resources in the past before, whether or not they've, they've, they're a journey mental health client or not. And then we also look at, of course, a lot of the response data around what time of the day calls are happening, um, what types of calls we're responding to. And, and this is something that, that's important um, because there are different programs around the country for the most part, respond to the same call types, but there are some differences out there. And one thing that, that we do respond to that isn't always considered a behavioral health crisis is that kind of typical check welfare or check person call. And um, when we looked at other programs, about 20 to 25 percent of the calls that they responded to were that type of check person or check welfare. And those are typically responded to by law enforcement here in Madison. And so for the, the fact that the, the CARES team can help manage some of those calls as well um, really took some of that operational stress off the police department. What we ended up finding in the end was that about 52% of the check person calls that we responded to did end up having some sort of mental health component to them. So um, we consider a check person or check welfare call appropriate for our CARES team. Other than that, um, it's just that wide range of behavioral health um, crisis, you know, from suicidal ideation to extreme anxiety, depression, drug and alcohol addiction issues. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're constantly meeting with the 911 center and the police department as well to see if there's other call types that either we should be going on or possibly shouldn't be going on. And, um, you know, it, we, we worry about the safety of our team, but we also need to understand that um, in the 911 world, every scene is not completely safe. And so there's just a lot of clinical judgment that has to happen, a lot of situational awareness and scene safety. And that's really 
in my opinion, um, other than medical care, the the paramedic on the team really has that expertise and understanding, uh, you know, how to keep themselves safe, uh, when to use the radio, when to call for backup, when it's time to leave the scene. And so fortunately, um, since our team has been in service, we haven't had any incidents of violence against our team members. Um, and, you know, that that obviously is one of my biggest concerns and um, and, and everything seems to be going well in that regard. So, um, you know, it, it really, in my opinion, this has been a, a success simply for the fact that we've been able to go on 2,600 calls, we've been able, been able to make a difference, and we've kept our team safe. And um, I, I just want to give a, a quick testimonial. Um, this is something that we do our best to gather, um, and, and this is kind of, and this is outcome-based stuff. So, um it, it's hard for us to follow up with every single client that we see. We started out trying to send out some little comment cards to any patient that we would see. Of course, we see a large homeless population. Um, we we um, interact with a lot of people because of the fact that they're in crisis. Um, they they maybe don't end up wanting to follow up with us. So I'll say that one barrier we have is finding out the ultimate outcomes of a lot of the folks that we see just because we don't have that follow up. But we do try to call people. We do try to follow up with them when possible. And so this testimonial here really speaks to, um, you know, ultimately the, the fact that the, the, the team has been doing some decent work out there. And so um, the, the I'll, I'll read this in case everyone can't. Um, they immediately developed rapport with our son and this was a classic example of sending the right person to the right call. It reduced trauma for both my son and our family and hopefully reduces the frequency of his trips to seek medical care. It was very comforting to us to know that we had this team of experts to rely on and to work with us over a couple of weeks to obtain the best support for our son. This program is very valuable in our community and from our perspective, very needed and successful. Um, so um, I'll end with that. And um, thank you all for your time. I, I hope it was helpful.